Welcome to webinar 2, Ancient Itineraries, Exploring Digital Art History. Stuart Dunn is Senior Lecturer and Head of the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. He is the Principal Investigator of the Ancient Itineraries Project. He is an archaeologist with interests in the history of cartography, digital approaches to landscape studies and spatial humanities. He works on projects in spatial narrative theory, critical GIS, Cypriot cultural heritage and the archaeology of mobility. Um, well, first of all, thank you, um, Orsa and everyone else, very much for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Yes, yeah, so this presentation is essentially um, the work of uh, this wonderful team here. So, Ariana Kula of the King's Digital Lab, my colleague. Professor Graham Earle of Digital Humanities, uh, Anna Foker, who we heard from earlier, and Will Wooten also from King's College London, the Department of Classics. So the Ancient Itineraries Project was uh, funded by the Getty Foundation very generously, uh, and it was one of their Advanced Institute projects. So our remit was to bring together a international collaboration of scholars for two long meetings, two-week meetings uh, in each case in autumn 2018 and spring 2019 to discuss the idea of digital art history and to think about what sort of problems the fields are facing, the field is facing, and what sort of solutions, technical or um, or epistemological or theoretical, we might come up with to some of those problems. So we were um, very fortunate to pull together this uh, tremendous slate of uh, international scholars from all over the place. So this presentation is, as I say, very much the product of this hive mind um, that, uh, that we were able to bring together uh, in the last 18 months or so. So um, I think that this question is framed very much in terms of the debate that Anna opened her presentation with earlier, uh, which she framed in terms of the disparity or the opposition, should I say, the dichotomy between digitalization and digitization. And this is a um, aspect that was picked up by Johanna Drucker, who is a scholar I'm sure that uh, many of us have read and interacted with it one way or another. So in 2013, she made exactly this distinction. She says a distinction has to be made between the use of online repositories and images, which is digitized art history, and the use of analytic techniques, which she calls digital art history. So I think this digitized versus digitalized um, is very important. It's a distinction between making resources available online uh, or widely available using the web and using computational modes of thinking to do something with that data. Uh, so Drucker goes on, I don't know if you can see that. Um, so she then goes on to say, we have to take into account the ways digital humanities more broadly have taken up computational techniques and to consider the specificity of visual art objects and their particular requirements and points of resistance. Um, so this point about the specificity of visual art objects is an extremely important one, and it's one that I'm going to pick up a little later. Um, but yes, I, I think this is very useful to just um, re restate that, that distinction between the availability of resources and what you do with them. So an opposing view um, was put forward two years ago by Claire Bishop, who argues essentially that um, the use of digital techniques, digitization, and by the extension in this passage, digitalization, um, is perhaps not so useful in art history, simply because by crunching material information that has been digitized in some way, you will never be able to explore the original material in a more creative or a more discursive or a less abstract fashion. And I think um, this is uh, a very important 
stance that she takes when she puts out this quotation that empirical findings never before highlighted in art history as a kind of aim of digital art history. You know, to do digital art history, there has to be some kind of eureka moment. You know, I put a bunch of data through a computer and find out something about the history of art that I didn't know before. Now, I happen to agree with both of these positions uh, to differing degrees. I think this is since I became a manager a year ago, I have to hedge and sit on the fence all the time. And I'm now starting to do that in my research. But I think that there, there are two very valid, valid and valuable viewpoints here. Um, and what I'm going to try and explore is how our thinking and the ancient itineraries project employed models around the semantic web and the linking of various different aspects can help us navigate a path between those two. So let's have a little bit of a think about this distinction between the digital and the digitalized. So this is of course an extremely famous um, uh, painting by Jan van Eyck, uh, the Arnolfini portrait. Uh, it is absolutely iconic. Uh, there are um, reproductions of it everywhere. It is probably among the most famous visual uh, items of visual art that have ever been produced. Now, of course, the web comes along in 2000 and whatever to, uh, no, earlier, that wasn't it. Um, so I should know, I teach the history of the internet, I should know these things. Um, but there are now multiple, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of different uh, representations, different digitizations of the Arnolfini wedding online in all different corners of the internet. Now, some you can just see from this uh, Google image search here, you know, there are differences in the way these digitizations are treated. Um, I've got the chat coming up here. Uh, Ah, 1997 was in the when the internet was founded. Well, this is actually a question I set my students, so I think I think we'll come back to that one later. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, where was I? So yes, some focus on the mirror um, in the background there, which really um, sort of focuses in on particular details and sort of around the edges here. This is quite a famous aspect of the portrait. Um, there are sort of miniatures actually painted into the frame of the mirror. But, you know, this doesn't really, I think it is fair to say, tell us, you know, anything about the history of the object, the connoisseurship surrounding the object, um, you know, why, why it might be interesting. Um, that is because we are looking here at, I guess, Google level metadata. So, of course, if we go in, a bit further and my screen isn't moving on again for some reason. Um, oh, there we go. So using a framework like Europeana, for example, this gets us to a next level because here we have um, structured, much more curated metadata, which will allow us to explore the concepts around um, a particular artwork like the Arnolfini wedding. So what I've just given as an example here is um, a, an, a, a, an example of exploring the concept of the wedding in Europeana. So there's all different objects, there's different types of objects, there's different levels of detail that I can burrow into the subject using a platform like this you know, without then having to go through the um, laborious process of manually exploring a Google image, images search. So this, obviously, this level of enrichment definitely takes us one stage further and is, um, you know, is the basis of um, a lot of, um, I guess, what um, Drucker would call digitized, uh, you know, di digitized art history. Um, there have been other initiatives, of course, the Flickr Commons, I don't know if anyone has used it, but back in the days when Flickr was a thing, um, the Commons website 
provided a forum for cultural heritage institutions and galleries to make uh, digitized um, surrogates of their collections available online under a Creative Commons license where copyright allowed them to do so. So again, this is another little bit of a step forward, I think. You know, this is a different level of metadata structure being given, but it's one that depends on pre-existing metadata structures, those of the participating heritage organizations. And Anna, in her talk, spoke a little bit about these different competing models and mentioned sort of crowdsourcing as another aspect of this. And crowdsourcing and, you know, Flickr is in a sense, is in one sense a crowdsourcing platform because the uh, users could, in a way, go in and add their own metadata tags to it. So again, there is another kind of metadata enrichment going on there. So I think it's useful in the context of this dichotomy, both between digital art history and digitalized art history and different levels of metadata enrichment to think about the, the concept of provenance, which is absolutely the bread and butter for the profession of art history, of course. Uh, but I think one issue which comes across or which has come across in the course of our ancient itineraries meetings is that whereas provenance has one particular meaning in art history, it means slightly different things in other contexts, particularly when we move into the more technical end of things. And this, I think, is an interesting um, sort of interdisciplinary issue for how we tackle digital art history. Um, so yes, from the French, uh, provenir, which to means to come from, to, of, to originate from a history of ownership of a valued object, such as a work of art, etc., etc. And there is an expectation that a full provenance will provide a full background uh, a full sort of informational profile of a valued object. But as with the examples of platforms I've just talked through, there are different levels of detail and completeness and um, what's the word, um, verisimilitude that metadata can offer as a vehicle of provenance. Uh, but provenance is of course absolutely critical, not only to the field of professional art history, but also to um, the profession of um, art sales. And so it's extremely important that any art object that is offered for sale in a suitably licensed forum like Christie's or London there, um, which have their own approaches and their own standards given to provenance. So this is very important to ensure that the artwork in question has been um, ethically sourced, that it hasn't been stolen, that its financial valuations are sound, that any competing cultural claims are dealt with in an ethical and transparent manner. And, you know, this kind of intersects with the way that museum collections deal with all, all these things as well. So there seems to be, to me, to be quite a lot of um, crossover between different ideas of what provenance is. And, you know, metadata is one way that is expressed. So, of course, this um, allows us to think in more detail about those digital quantitative approaches to provenance, which uh, many organizations and institutions have come up with over the last few years. So one of the most important examples for the field, I, I would suggest, is the Getty Research Institute's uh, Provenance Index, the GPI, which is a kind of field-wide professional standard for documenting the um, provenance of artworks, um, you know, taking quite a metadata-like um, view of that. Uh, so I'm going to come to that, um, but come to that, come to, sorry, excuse me, come back to that in a moment. Um, but this, I think, drives us to those slightly more technical I, um, 
framings of the concept of provenance. So if like the GPI, for example, the Great Getty Provenance Index, you know, you are framing provenance as a networked collective of quantitative metadata labels. This, I think, takes us to a space that is at least between those art historical ideas of provenance and more web-based ideas of provenance. So the, 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 W3 the W3C consortium, for example, describes provenance as a record that describes the people's institutions, entities, etc., the activities involved in producing, influencing, or delivering a piece of data or a thing. So the concept of provenance, the concept of metadata, can be applied to both artworks and to data on the web. And that, you know, I, I really think it is not hugely useful to, to break those down too much. Um, and then, as it says there, uh, good curation on the web demands good provenance. Provenance is no longer merely the nicety of artists, academics and winemakers. It is an ethic we expect. So just to illustrate that, this is the, the, the Getty Provenance Index, and I thought I might try and see if I could be very brave and actually share a web page. Can you see my screen still? Can you see the network? No, we see your slides right now. Let, let me just see if I can do something about that, because... Uh, yeah. It does work way better um, on the Zoomable web page. Um, okay, I'm not going to spend too long fooling about with this. No worries. Okay, I'll, I'll just go back to the screen grab. I would like. Uh, your your to... mic is is uh, going off sometimes a little bit so just uh, yeah if it's okay okay can you hear me now yeah very well thank you okay um okay so let me just put my uh, this is the equivalent of the adapter not working isn't it yeah, so what we have here in the in this network visualization of the provenance index that the Getty have provided us with is a set of connections between art dealerships and some of the main art markets in the first 20 years of the 19th century. So London, Paris, Rotterdam, um, various um, Dutch ports and so forth. And this is incredibly useful because this gives us a very uh, clear overview of where is particularly important, you know, where there are most connections between nodes like Amsterdam, for example, and particular dealers. And that shows you which particular dealers are dealing most with which particular markets. But I think a, uh, in a sense, a limitation of this sort of visualization, and this is just a general comment on network visualization, not on the Getty Provenance Index, um, is that in a sense, it uh, amplifies and entrenches very structured models of metadata that were there already. And I think it implicitly limits our way to looking outside what is really obvious in those connections within the network. So I think one of the key ideas for me that came out of our ancient itineraries project is how can we, within a network-based visualization, how can we look for what is not obvious in that? You know, how can we pick up the kind of things that a discursive art historian might be interested in? Um, and I know there have been um, other initiatives working with the Getty and others like the Link.Art uh, initiative looking at this. Um, so, you know, that, that's another set of conversations uh, that, that we're having. But this takes us on to the little case study I would like to look briefly at, which is a particular artwork which we spent quite a lot of time looking at, which is the statue of the dancing fawn at Leighton House in West London. Um, no doubt this is bringing back many happy memories for Anna, um, who, who 
is hopefully still there somewhere. So Leighton House was the uh, residence of Sir Frederick Leighton, who was a um, grand tourer, a collector, a philanthropist. Uh, he was all, all of these things and he amassed this amazing art collection, um, which is now functions as a domestic museum under the stewardship of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. And one of the centerpieces of this collection is this um, a statue of a, uh, of a dancing fawn. So this is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, it is a copy, this statue, of an original that was originally um, uh, discovered in Pompeii, in the House of the Fawn, in fact. Uh, so the, this particular image goes through various different um, iterations, you know, from AD 79 uh, or whatever, right through to the present day in West London. And as you can see on the left hand side there, this is from the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea's um, online catalogue where it documents the later art collection. So this is, I think, a fairly um, standard, a, a fairly robust metadata catalogue of what this statue is all about. But, you know, when you start digging into the history of the object and the history of the objects around the object, then this starts, I think, to bring out some of these interesting networked, um, uh, sort of networked questions. So what we started doing, uh, and we did this uh, completely manually in the first instance, we just thought of what kind of metadata, both relating to the object and relating to abstract ideas which describe things related to the object could we document. So the chronology, for example, you know, when, when was it created? And, you know, in what time window did it exist? Um, where did it come into existence? Where did it end its existence? You know, I know there was a discussion in the previous presentation about CDOC, so you can plug CDOC links into this. You can plug place types into this, and you can then link um, sort of more conventional, if you were, uh, as, as it were, art history uh, metadata headings like the uh, the ULAN, the, um, the, the um, Getty Names um, list, uh, and so on and so on. And so we built up a set of what we call these segments to document the history of the image of the dancing fawn, basically from Pompeii to Leighton House, and framed these almost as a narrative with the sections of the narrative consistently described according to that um, metadata list, as it were. And um, I'll have another go at sharing my screen. I waste too much time doing this because it would be quite nice if I could. Do no worries, this. we do have uh, quite a lot of time. So. Okay. Um, so what we did, you share. Have you got that? Have you got a nice yes, colourful map? Yes, now we network? have a nice colourful map. Oh, excellent. So, um, Using the Neo4j platform, we kind of hacked these um, these uh, sort of DIY provenance lists into a network graph, which contains not just objects or literal places, or, or sorry, literals such as places, but also concepts, also ideas, also um, references to styles and that kind of thing. And, you know, I mean, you can have all sorts of fun just, just pulling, pulling these around, but essentially it starts with this literal in the middle here, the Pompeii form, which you can list as, you know, we can just um, express all the links. Oh, I'm already there with that. Um, so we start with the original object, but we link that to an abstraction, a conceptual object, which is a, basically a linked data um, reference to you know the idea of the dancing fawn in general because dancing fawns are a mythological motif you know throughout you know from you know throughout from Greek mythology and so forth 
And then we look at what other instances there have been of the dancing fawn. Uh, we look at where those instances have been displayed. So there was a representation in the British Museum, for example. So you can pull out all the links to the British Museum representation, etc., etc. And I'm not quite mad enough to try and do a complete um, demonstration live so I am just going to do the rest through screen grabs so let me just reshare my slides okay hopefully you have my slides back now yes good excellent and so um, just to sort of talk you through about this through this a little bit so there were a total of six instances of the dance of the abstract dancing form so there is the Pompeii dancing fawn off to the right there, uh, an example in the Uffizi in the British Museum, the Uffizi Gallery, the British Museum, it's one in the Royal Gallery, so, sorry, the Royal Academy Gallery in London, uh, and also the Leighton House fawn. Um, now this, as I mentioned, also allowed us to um, build events into this model, as it were. So we have, just as, to give two examples here, uh, abstractions of the move of the original form from Pompeii to the Naples Museum, and a completely separate event, the original creation of the Pompeii form, which of course we can abstract as um, CDOC CRM entity types, entity classes. So that again allows us to be consistent about the way that we describe those segments of information. Same goes for time periods. So we used um, basically a variety of different literals for referencing time periods. So Wikidata was one. So we have a, a literal representing the 19th century. So we have uh, two events linked to the 19th century. And also the periodo um, gazetteer of time periods, which was, was very useful, certainly for the earlier periods that we were dealing with in the history of this object. Um, we are also able to use abstract um, representations of styles using, for example, the Getty's Art and Architecture Thesaurus. So this is a link representing the imperial um, Roman cultural period. So that's not as a time period, that's as a period of um, cultural um, homogeneity, as it were. Um, not a statement that we are making, a statement that we are relying on the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus to make. So again, this is very much relying on other institutions um, or authorities. And also, this was discussed in the previous presentation, there is of course places uh, for which we have primarily used the Pleiades Gazetteer. Um, now this is where I think it gets a little bit interesting because of course um, we can simply point to a URI for Pompeii as in this example and say well this is um, you know that this is a representation of that one point on the earth's surface uh, which is Pompeii. But what if we wanted to dig into that in a bit more detail? What if we wanted to say is, you know, if there was a less well-known place, um, a less well-attested place, you know, how would we be able to um, capture those sorts of authorities? Well, this I think is where I would go back to a previous project that I've worked on, which is the um, uh, Gazetteer project in Cyprus. And in this, rather than attesting places at the top level, we attested the names of places. And of course, the spellings of place names can change and do change over time. And they change quite dramatically in some cases, particularly in the Mediterranean. So, for example, for all these spellings of Paphos here, for example, we have an attestation link. So we have one kind of abstract um, place that is Paphos, but it has multiple uh, different attestations. So this is, this I think is the next stage of the project. So we integrated it with the now uh, deprecated Parafleo platform, so it's just an example of that there. But this I think is an example of where ends in 
or to other nodes in semantic networks should never be the end of the story. I mean, there are always further ways in which you can break down attestations for those nodes. And that's the kind of thing that art historians are really interested in. So I'm coming up to the end of my uh, allotted 30 minutes. I might even overshot it slightly. So I'm going to conclude with what I think are two really important questions to come out of um, the Ancient Itineraries Institute, which I think can inform a range of um, options going forward, be that through existing initiatives such as Link Not Art, um, you know, such as the Getty and so forth. The first is, do objects have a particular type of significance when they are artworks? You know, is there a way in which an object that is an artwork is significant or complex in a way that any other kind of object isn't. And this gets to much more fun fundamental and philosophical questions about what, what is an artwork. But to give you an example, uh, here we have a photo of a 19th century photo of a set of pots from Cyprus, which um, I bought when I was there a few years ago. Um, the photo that is, not the pots. Um, and, you know, just from looking at this, I can tell that there are, there's at least one Bronze Age pot on the back left there. It's white slip where there are sort of geometric period and so forth. Now, when I was researching this kind of thing as a PhD student, looking at East Mediterranean archaeology, uh, I was always inhabiting a world whereby looking at the morphology and the typology and the decoration of these sorts of objects were described as art history, okay? Now the Arnolfini portrait is also an art object and most definitely the subject of art history. So I guess my question is, is what sort of significance do these types of objects share by virtue of the fact that they are artworks, that they are susceptible to the epistemologies of, of art history or of digital art history. Um, because, I mean, I guess to go back to the Cyprus example there, I mean, you know, we wouldn't necessarily think of um, pottery, ceramic vessels like this in terms of connoisseurship, of, um, you know, taste or fluctuations in taste. Well, I mean, we might, but I think in a much less granular level than we would an object like the Arnolfini portrait. And my second question is, does history have a particular type of significance when it is art history? So we all know what a history is, right? You know, it is about books and manuscripts uh, most of the time, also about events and characters and so forth. So what I would really like to do going forward as the next phase of this project is look at the ways of, look at ways of um, integrating this kind of network approach with more conventional sort of historical slash art historical um, ways of looking at things. So for example, integrating um, the kinds of networks I've been, network analysis I've been showing at with text, for example, um, on platforms like um, the Pelagios Ricogito platform, or the annotation of objects, or that kind of thing. Um, so I guess just to sum up, I mean, what I have learned from the Ancient Itineraries project is that thinking about, is that we have to think about metadata and provenance interchangeably if we are going to steer that difficult pathway between the Claire Bishop way of looking at things and the Johanna Drucker way of looking at things. And that really, I think, is a you know, the ultimate question for me of um, enriching metadata, I guess. So I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I will now hand back to Orsha. So, uh, Stuart, the first uh, comment is from Alexander Huber of uh, uh, Oxford. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to get from small hand-coded examples, like the phone one, which have been around for a few years now, to linked open data on scale for thousands and millions of records. Uh, so if you start with that one. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I guess that uh, it would depend, you know, why you're wanting to make the information available. I mean, are you wanting it to be made available in order to link to other collections? Um, or are you wanting to use it to interrogate the history of one particular object? Because, I mean, I think those are two slightly different ways of using network analysis. And as I say, what... what um, what I found really interesting about the way the uh, example of the fawn kind of emerged was that this was about representing an individual object, one object as a network, rather than about representing, you know, you know, networks of objects, networks uh, as collections. Um, so. Uh, to try and sort of creep towards an answer to that question. I mean, uh, yes, I suppose you have to look at creative ways of integrating those small scale hand coded examples with the larger scale, with LO linked open data at scale uh, frameworks that the semantic web already provide. And I think that's something that, um, you know, the, 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 you know the, there is a lot of potential for looking at in the future. Uh, so I guess the second question there is, is it the responsibility of institutions to turn their catalogues into LOD catalogues? Um, is it the responsibility of digitization projects to build semantic into... Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's a responsibility, but I certainly think it's a very good idea because, you know, if you don't do it, somebody else will, you know, via Wikidata or, or, you know, some other publicly available source of information. So, yes, one, one certainly should. Um, you know, whether we get into the realms of it being an ethical requirement, um, well, who knows? I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. That could actually be quite an interesting discussion in itself and something for a good workshop. So like what uh, uh, giving access to uh, to collections and archives um, is this is there should there be some sort of mutual uh, beneficiary built into this to make sure that uh, both parts get something out of it. But of course, it it will bring a lot of extra requirements for humanities researchers to think and to get good networks where people can help them do things like this. Um, I can, uh, we can move on, uh, we can think on this on a, on a while and I'm going to ask a few questions about that myself, but uh, we can ask another question now from Carlotta Capuru. Uh, thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to know if in tracing the provenance of the art object and describing it with metadata, you consider to provide also information of its context and its variations that often is crucial information for artwork. Very good question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think this is, um, I think this is one of the really powerful potentials of the linked open data approach in this space. And I think, you know, Art, which I've mentioned a couple of times, has been demonstrating this really successfully. I mean, you know, you don't, in semantic web, so linked open data, you know, you don't have to make an assertion that one particular version of events, events is true. All you have to do is make an assertion and you can then attach as many different interpretations as you possibly can. And I think that is a really interesting set of possibilities there for you know carrying over these you know art history um perceptions of provenance into the more web-based perceptions of provenance and that's definitely something that i want to uh, you know i would like to try to try and do more of in the future definitely so we also have a question from natalie tibolt uh or tibolt uh, in our museums, uh, we often have a large number of unknown artists. How to properly represent the works of these unknown artists in, a, in the semantic web, where there's little data from authorities, the iconography of these works is a good basic for the semantic web, uh, subjects, period styles. Have you considered other possibilities? Mm. 
Well, yeah, again, I mean, I think this is a, another really, I think this goes back to, you know, to some, to, to some extent what Anna was talking about this morning, um, which is that there is a danger that some of these hyper quantitative networks um, amplify voices that are already loud, artists who are already well known, you know, the Van Eyck's of the world and the Arnolfini portraits of the world, uh, which, you know, already have a lot of exposure. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, I, I would probably fall back on the same sort of answer. I mean, if you don't have a means of, um, of representing those unknown artists yourself as linked open data, then you can use other sources like, you know, you can create your own references in Wikidata, for example, or have a targeted Wikidata sprint about those um, artists. I mean, this has been done in various different contexts. Uh, so for example, there is a Wikidata, sorry, rather a Wikipedia, editing group which focuses on women in classics for example and making sure that female you know female classicists throughout history have wikipedia pages i think it's very much the same sort of principle because uh, you know uh, uh, an endpoint you know a, a, a node for linked data can be anywhere you like on the web it doesn't have to be in your official museum presence um, but you then have to have a conversation of what sort of control you need to have of that data. So I think it's as much about your own institutional policies as the profile of the, um, the people or the objects that you're wanting to represent. Quite. Uh, we have a uh, question from Michael Nice. Uh, I'm going, it's a bit long, I'm going to read a comment. Uh, as an archaeologist with a focus on the Viking Age animal art, mostly fibula, uh, I am interested in its certain features and data workshop attribution um, that are not necessarily anticipated by museum curators who instigate their databases. Uh, uh, who instigates the database, uh, but the more interesting to other researchers? Yes, uh, there have been attempts by certain museums to let the informed and also not so informed public to participate in gathering data, but there is also the managing aspect. There's a heavy workload to curators with limited resources. Do you have suggestions for manageable strategies for expert slash public participation when designating and expanding those databases? Well, that is pretty much the question I was going to ask, so very good for Michael for asking that. <laughs> Yeah, um, so uh, that's kind of the perennial question with crowdsourcing any aspect of um, cultural heritage information, I guess. Um, and this was very much a question that we came up against with that Cyprus Gazetteer project that I briefly mentioned that I thought could sort of continue some of these chains of attestation in terms of place. So when we started that project, the idea was that it should be a kind of open platform that anyone could contribute Cypriot place names to or spellings of Cypriot place names to and you know there would be an editorial process and you know we would make sure that nothing too political happened with Greek and Turkish names and, and that kind of thing but we found that model really didn't work at all uh, mainly because the general public didn't care enough about Cypriot place names to um, start making lots of contributions which is Fair enough, I guess. Um, but um, yes, also kind of access to, to source material and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and there's very much the issue of the quality and control of information, which, which, you, which you mentioned. Uh, the way we address that is we got a series of workshops together, um, actually with students, uh, students who were working with texts. And we sort of got them to, um, you know, to uh, sort of discuss and create content based on texts they were working with. So I think that kind of targeted approach is much more successful for this kind of project. I mean, again, there are ethical questions um, because, you know, unless there is some benefit to the people doing the contributing, there is the possibility that it could be seen as exploitative. So there has to be some kind of quid pro quo 
um, some kind of benefit, I guess. Um, I, I think we sort of stopped thinking of it as crowdsourcing and more thinking of it as community, sorry, community sourcing. Um, so, you know, so, so getting information from, uh, as you say in the question there, sort of free, free expertise from peers. I mean, yeah, the, the question is sort of, sort of finding those peers uh, who will not be very large in number usually and setting up some kind of relationship with them to, um, to, to get that information. Yeah, and uh, I can. I'm just going to jump in here before before we move on to the next question because one of the things that I personally feel like uh, when there is some uh, some rather miscommunication miscommunication sometimes is like certain information for the museum collections they have to be restricted to they can't fill up with everything that everyone could ever wanted be uh, wanting like for instance if you are a specialized researcher and you are very interested in uh, in fibula uh, but uh, the researcher can of, of course create their own re they can take the data from all these various uh, collections where there are remains of fibula and they can create an enriched database of their own and this is, of course, require getting extra help from specialists, but you can make that database uh, available to others if you have uh, added it properly with proper standards. You can upload it to research database uh, repositories, or, and you can even, as, as you have done in your project, Ancient Itineraries, like build your own visualization of this data. So kind of like working hand in hand, saying that, okay, I'm when I'm doing a research project, I'm going to create a lot more data than the museum is going to use, but by making sure that you have some sort of key, when I'm talking about this object, it's this particular object in the museums, you can sort of create uh, an, an additional uh, database, uh, and that, that's perhaps the power of linked open data, that, uh, that both parties can get what they want. Um, but have you, like, uh, how, how is it, how common is it in England for researchers to share their databases, would you say? Yes. Um, I suppose this is another sort of perennial problem um, because, you know, a lot of people, a lot of researchers don't necessarily want to share data that they perceive to be incomplete and therefore um, of you know, not sufficient quality for their work to be judged as being good, as it were. Um, I mean, I, there's been, I mean, this is, you know, there, there, there is a long old debate about this, uh, certainly in the UK. I mean, we used to have various uh, repositories where academic data was deposited um, up till about 15 years ago when the funding was cut, which, you know, is another issue that we always come up against. Um, but I mean, I suppose the, the issue is that sharing data, um, you know, sharing usable data is never a cheap or easy process, despite, you know, what, what the semant you know, what the web might um, uh, trick you into thinking sometimes. Exactly. We can uh, move on to a, a question by Karin Tetteris. Uh, and her question is, so I'm the curator of a collection of military flags taken as war booty and would like love to find a digital way to visualize their itineraries through histories. That's a great idea. I'm thinking of linking the information about them to historical maps, but also to biographical data on historical persons available online. Uh, and um, any ideas, any suggestions for her? Uh, well, I don't know if, if Anna would like to jump in, but that sounds like the sort of thing that you can do in Ricochita with an image of a historic map. Um, in fact, that sounds conceptually like the sort of work you've been doing recently, Anna. Am I allowed to respond? <laughs> yes, please, Anna. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think this is something that you can very easily do with uh, very easy platforms that are open source and open to, for everybody to use. 
Uh, the first question is, what kind of structured data do you have about place? And what kind of maps do you have? And how would you like to annotate them? Uh, I would be really happy to hear more about this and help you. You can shoot me an email uh, and uh, we can, if that, if that is of help, we can discuss about it more. Uh, also, it's like sharing the, the, the uh, global instance of Recogito, which is the, the platform we use. At the moment, this is enriched with several different data sets for space, uh, to say the least. Uh, gazetteers, as uh, um, Stuart would refer them to, and that's structured data about space. And also, it enables you to free tag things. But of course, uh, the options that are in the global instance pertain to the ancient world. There's also geo names. Uh, which is not very perfect when it comes to structured temporal uh, data. Uh, it, if anything, you know, most gazetteers have still their infidelities that you have to work around. Uh, but it pretty much depends on what your data looks like. If you can do this with maps, uh, or uh, I just have to see that question again. Military flags taken as war booty. Okay, fantastic. So yes, you can totally do this uh, with Rekokito. Uh, you might have to tweak it a little bit and add your own sort of structural voca structure vocabularies that, that have to do with the military flags, spatial and temporal data. So what did the world look back then and when they were moved and, and what, what, you know, because the world changes. I mean, I think I, I have to, we quote each other all the time, Stuart, I have, I have seen today, but I think that, uh, that brings back to the key idea that you ask that uh, when if we are to visualize a network how can we pick up what's important and the first question to ask is what is important uh, there what exactly is the kind of information that you have and how would you map it like is it is it the is it copies is, is it digital pictures of the flags themselves uh, how would you symbolize them? What kind of symbologies would you use? Uh, what kind of information would you like to enrich those flags with? Place, time, space? Uh, it all depends on, you know, whether or not you can structure data, basically, to make sense. Yeah. And, and this strikes me as like, uh, all these ideas are good and I can understand it can be a bit overwhelming because when you start thinking, okay, but for instance, this was a very clear and specific uh, project, it was great as an example, but then the question is, okay, so we need someone who knows the, the collections, we need some, someone who knows flags and we know that flags from different countries at these times, uh, someone who is under, understands different types of historical maps that are available. And of course, sometimes it, you can just start, you can start and you can say that, okay, this is good enough. Uh, but for me, what I would, I would just like to say that I would like to see for the future is perhaps uh, thinking that, okay, we have this great, we at this museum have this great idea. We have this great material. So are there master students and researchers who would like to do, they can do specific things uh, uh, in different parts and say, can you help us add this information? Can you help us put, uh, double check this information? This is something that we can use as a very interesting case study in a way, because uh, to get help that is kind of, and I really liked what you said, Stuart, about community uh, sourcing, instead of putting together uh, specific individuals that you know that you can have a more direct contact with and maybe start with a good basic knowledge and maybe even very advanced knowledge on a very specific topic. Uh, what really is needed then is a project leader that can keep the threads together. Um, but this is, um, but it, and it would be interesting to see more cases of uh, involving students, involving younger researchers, uh, to help adding, because no one can do everything by themselves anymore. Um, if I am to summarize and say Yes, I think things. that's a bit, bit, bit. So I just want to ask Stuart, do you want to add something before uh, Anna uh, makes a bit of a summary and um, find them? Just, just to thank you very much for all the questions and discussion. Very, very helpful. Oh, Anna. I, I think from uh, Stuart's excellent talk, uh, and I'm looking forward to the rest of our excellent talks that are coming up in the next few days, uh, I would like to stand in the two important questions of the end, 
uh, and do objects have a particular kind of significance when they are artworks and whether or not uh, the style, uh, for example, one could say, yes, they, you know, we can talk about style, we can talk about materials, we can talk about provenance, we can talk about, you know, art catalogs. And then the second question, does history uh, in particular has a significance uh, and, and in what ways and when it is history? So just to wrap this up, I would like to say that uh, what, what the talk has taught me at least today was that uh, we, are, we are talking about artifacts that are made by humans and we are talk when we talk about humans, we don't really necessarily talk, we talk about the complexity of representing humans, but we talk about the, compl the complexity of representing humans, not as like some description, but as affinities. And, and holding on to those affinities of what it means to be an artwork or a human or, a, or, or, or you know, the Adolfini, uh, um, the Arnolfini uh, wedding and all of the things that come with it uh, is a very interesting question. And if we are to enrich any set of data with additional information, it has to take into consideration those affinities. That's a really good point. Uh, if there are no more comments or suggestions, uh, Larissa, would you, if you have anything you want to add, you can join in. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a lovely workshop and I'm looking very forward to our next events tomorrow and on Tuesday next week. Exactly. So I hope to see you all again there too. Yes, we certainly hope so. So tomorrow we will have Koral Kagolub, who is uh, in information science and, and library science, who's going to talk about standards and, and uh, for humani uh, uh, the humanities and trying to find information as a, in the humanities. Uh, and also Karin Glossemann from the National Museum, so the National Gallery of Sweden, who is going to talk about what they went through digitizing their collections and making uh, and working, which meant working a lot with metadata. So it's a really interesting project. So we hope to see you tomorrow. And thank you very much for asking questions and participating and being patient with us when everything wasn't working. And we will make these uh, recordings available as soon as possible afterwards as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.